Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 120, Names, with Gretchen McCulloch. I, I feel like this is very like much an esoteric episode of Spirits, but in the best possible way. Oh yeah, we go on about how much we admire Gretchen, and this really was one of my favorite conversations that we've had in a long time. So I am stoked, and I'm trying to think here, Julia. I don't think I would ever ask the true name of any of our new patrons, because that would give me too much power. That's fair. So welcome, and keep your name to yourself, Michaela and Haley, as well as our supporting producer-level patrons, Philip, Julie, Eeyore, Christopher, Alicia, Kathy, Vinny, Danica, Marissa, Sammy, Josie, Neil, Jessica, Phil Fresh, and Deborah. Oh, Amanda, I think that you know who we've already given our true names to. Is it our legend-level patrons? It is. Sarah, James, Jess, Sarah P, Sandra, Audra, Mercedes, Jack Marie, and Leanne. It is. And Leanne Davis definitely knows my true name. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Leanne knows my heart and my soul. What's up, Leanne? This is the support that makes our show happen. It's what lets us keep our names hidden and our auras powerful every day. I don't disagree with that. And this week, we'd really love to encourage anyone who likes spirits to check out our Patreon. Just have a look, see a cute photo of all of us that was taken in Portland that I just put up on the uh, Patreon page. It's adorable. That's patreon.com slash spirits podcast. And if you can spare even $1 an episode, that goes a long way toward letting us do fun things like live shows and trips and conferences and upgrading our microphones as Julia just did. I just did. I sound great now. So thank you to every single person who supports us. And if you choose to support us this week, welcome. Amanda, um, for our drink choices this week, I thought that probably our best option, because we do talk a little bit about in this episode, kind of like our 90s AIM names. And I realized we weren't drinking in the 90s because we were but we children. But We were like maximum we were eight. Yes. But I wanted to pick out a 90s inspired cocktail to kind of go with the motif. So I picked the Bramble, which is gin, lemon juice, simple syrup, and blackberry liqueur. Which one did you pick? I picked a Cosmo, which is what my mom occasionally ordered in restaurants and therefore, to me, is the most 90s cocktail. But I'm drinking it in a Gimlet glass because I'm an uncoordinated nerd and martini glasses were made for comical, like, onstage waiter accidents. Onstage waiter accidents and also if you are just a very drunk older woman who is going after a younger man in a Broadway play. Mm, Yes, totally. It's actually ladies, not bad, you know? Ladies who Not lunch. huge into vodka, but uh, lime and, and uh, cranberry? Can't say no. Can't say no. Reminds me of the Bailey, which is my uh, go-to airplane drink of ginger ale and cranberry, half and half. Mm, it's smart. Delicious. That's a good one. Is that named after your uh, your sister? It sure is, because at six, mm-hmm. she was like, can I have half cran- cranberry juice and half ginger ale? And we were all like, whoa, this bitch is classy. Dang, classy, classy girl. Julia, speaking of class, what do you have to recommend to us this week? Uh, I have a new audio fiction podcast for us to listen to this week. Um, I highly recommend checking out. Actually, I have two. One is kind of a self-plug and the other one is not. So I have Caravan, which is uh, from the Whisper Forge family of products. Uh, my my people and also our good good friends and Caravan is about a man named Samir who uh, accidentally falls into a canyon that's full of demons and monsters and he just real horny for him like you do like you do sometimes you just got to get like horny for monsters I don't blame him Uh, and I also highly recommend this week the podcast Windfall which is You've heard me talk about Our Fair City on the podcast before, and I highly recommend Windfall because it feels like the uh, emotional child or younger sibling of Our Fair City. It is a weird dystopian cityscape that is also funny and very well built when it comes to the world building. That sounds like a wonderful thing to lose yourself in, in these strangely springy and then rainy days. Yeah, not not enjoying that. Enjoying those two podcasts, not enjoying rainy springiness. Well, Julia, you can uh, bring some levity to your springtime with our sponsor this week, Stitch Fix, which will send you super colorful, lovely floral print springy things, if you ask. And you can go to stitchfix.com slash spirits to get 25% off when you decide to keep all of the springtime items in your box. And to Skillshare, an online learning community where you can learn and teach just about anything like I do. 
Visit Skillshare.com slash spirits two, the number two, to get two months of Skillshare premium for free. I am very excited again to recommend Amanda's fantastic class. I'm sure I'll tell you more about it. All right. So we'd love to remind you again this week, please check out our Patreon, at least just to look at that adorable photo of all three of us, which I want to like blow up to canvas size and hang in the multitudio. Yes, please. But now without further ado, enjoy Spirits Podcast episode 120, Names with Gretchen McCulloch. We are so excited to welcome Gretchen McCulloch here. Uh, Gretchen, I think I told you in person when we met at Patreon, but I've been reading your blog for like eight years, and so meeting you in person was kind of a big deal for me. (laughs) But Gretchen is the internet linguist, and you might have read her writing on The Toast or on Wired, and now your book, Because Internet is coming out very soon. And you host a podcast, Ling Enthusiasm. So Gretchen is just a, a woman about town. Gretchen, welcome. Hello. I'm so excited to be here. So Gretchen, I, I am very curious as to what mythological and perhaps linguistic thing you're going to be telling us about this week. When I was thinking about where is the intersection between a mythology podcast and a linguistics podcast, uh, I ended up with names and how we use names to create power over people, sometimes to have mystical powers, sometimes to, you know, fight evil, and sometimes just to make more weird or think about more weirdly the society that we already live in. Hell yeah. I think we talk about names quite a bit in our in our podcast, so I'm very, very excited to see what we're going to be specifically talking about. The most obvious name story uh, from, a, from a myth and legends perspective is the Rumpelstiltskin story. Of course, everyone. I feel like everyone knows the Rumpelstiltskin story, but they might not. Would you Would you mind just walking us through the important beats of it? This is what I remember. Okay. Spinning gold. Uh, that's all. So I certainly could use a refresher. Uh, newborn child. Firstborn child. Okay, so I think the story is uh, there's a young girl who... Is it her or her father makes a boast that she can tur- spin straw into gold? It is almost always the parent. The same thing <laughs> happened to uh, Andromeda, I want to say. Yeah, it's um, always the parent. Um, and somehow, uh, like a magical, uh, this comes to the attention of a prince. And she gets locked in like a warehouse um, filled with straw. And she gets told you need to spin us all into gold before tomorrow or you have three days or something uh and you'll uh or else you'll be killed i think is how it goes yeah that's usually how how it goes (laughs) that's a classic fairy tale twist or you'll die and then obviously she can't do this and so this mysterious little man shows up and offers to do it for her if she will give him something and i think some versions of the story probably have this happen three times and she gives him something else the first two times but in the final ultimate thing where she has to spin a whole bunch of straw into gold um he asks for her firstborn child oh no don't don't do that don't do I, I that. Mean, fairy tales, right? But she's going to die anyway, so she's like, okay, fine. And he does it. He spins the straw into gold. Um, and then she marries the prince. And years later, she has this child. And he shows back up again saying, like, hello, I've come to claim what you owe me. And she says, I can't do this. Is there any way I can get out of this? And he says, well, if you can guess my name, then you can get out of this. That okay. seems like a fair contract. We probably ha- should have written this down beforehand, but... You know, this this reminds me of a show I have been watching an awful lot of on Netflix. It's like an Australian show about two uh, like faux rivals who go to different antique stores and then mm. have to spend the same amount of money. And then they sell the items at auction and they have to compete to see who wins. Ooh. It's so pure. I'm sorry. I, love it. I need to know the name of the show immediately. Um, let me look at my Netflix history. Okay. Please hold. <laughs> Please hold as we check Amanda's Netflix history. Clash of the Collectibles. Oh my gosh, that's Ooh. very good. <laughs> it's very good. In any case, they will often talk to these proprietors of like antique stores, and the antique store person will say, "Oh, well, I had it marked at two hundred, um, but you're asking for one hundred. How about we like flip a coin or have like an arm wrestling match, and then we'll see who wins." <laughs> and this very much reminds me of that. Only it's the highest stakes possible. The highest stakes possible. <laughs> a human life. A human life. Uh, And so I don't remember in the fairy tale how exactly she discovers his name, but she figures out somehow. 
I, I vaguely remember uh, her like following him into the woods and him bragging about it, thinking that oh, no one is listening. That's right. And then she overhears it, and then he comes back, and she's like, "Yo, it's Rumpelstiltskin," and he is like, "How did you figure it out?" And I think he gets so angry that he like stomps a hole in the floor and disappears into the underworld. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds yeah. like something the French would add. <laughs> <laughs> so and obviously, there are many retellings of this in various different forms, but I think that's the kind of outline of the Rumpelstiltskin story and this idea that knowing someone's name and the name is so distinctive as Rumpelstiltskin, you know, gives you that kind of power over them. Yeah, because you know something uh, inherent about them or something about their essence. And in lots of fairy stories, you know, it, like a, a kind of fey wisdom is, you know, don't eat the food, don't drink the water and don't tell them your name. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell them your true name. And I was thinking about the Rumpelstiltskin story recently because I read this book by Naomi Novak called Spinning Silver. And it's kind of a retelling in novel length form with a lot of adaptations of the Rumpelstiltskin story, which is not one of those fairy tales you see retold as often as like Sleeping Beauty or something like that. Yes, it definitely doesn't have that Disney princess vibe that yeah, everyone else no, is probably going for. There's no Disney Rumpelstiltskin, is there? No, I don't think so. If there is, it's That'd very, very obscure. Dark. <laughs> it's like that really original version of the animated Hobbit. I imagine that like that level of like vague creepiness has to be involved. Yeah, probably from like the 1940s or something. <laughs> Got to be. Um, so anyway, the Naomi Novak book is really good. Um, it's it's still got a magical element. There's still a fairy tale, you know, fairy type creature and so on. But the way that the main character ch converts she doesn't spin straw into gold. She changes silver into gold. And she does this through her shrewd business sense. It's so good. <gasps> what? It's it's just Amanda, but in book form. <laughs> like, How did she do this? is what I want out of my fairy tale heroines is that they have good business sense. Um, So she, I mean, basically, you know, she buys low and sells high. <laughs> like yeah. the characters on the Australian uh, show. She's working the market. It's all good. <laughs> Yeah. That's amazing. Well, and, and the details of this is she lives in this small village with her parents and her father is the town's moneylender. So this is set in kind of like fantasy Eastern Europe and her family is Jewish and they're the only Jewish family in their town. And her father's the town moneylender, but he's not very good at being a moneylender. And so she eventually takes over the family business as like a teenager and is a much better moneylender. And so and she gets all this like business advice from her grandpa, who's the moneylender in like a bigger town. Uh, she So he's giving her the, all this business advice and she's like converting the silver that she gets from money lending into gold through like various means of like buying stuff in the bigger town and selling it at a profit in her small town That's oh so my god good. i'm so <laughs> into smart. it it's so good um and it's it's like it's a really interesting setting and it's just the whole story is is really enjoyable but she has this you know fairy character and i don't want to spoil too much but she who, of course, hears of her boast that she can turn silver into gold and so on and comes after her wanting her to do this. And she, at some point, you know, very innocently asks, well, you know, oh, yeah, what? I don't even know your name. What's your name? And he is very offended that you could possibly want to know his name. Yeah, you can't just be uh, upfront with those things. Then where would all his power be? And then, of course, you have this kind of like system of patronage by giving people nicknames because that's like an honor to be bestowed a, a name by someone. And there's all these kind of like what when you name it, you make it true. Ooh. It, that's like the, the Puritan thing, right? Where they would name their child Chastity or Prudence or something like that. Yeah, or like these long phrases. There's so many of them. They're so complicated. Whosoever does strike you on the first cheek, then let him strike you on the second cheek or something like this. Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I clearly need to do a lot more reading. I don't know. My family version of this is like, I have three cousins named Danny. So there's Big Danny, Little Danny, and then just Danny. Um, <laughs> and in, in Irish families, there have to be, yeah, normally you, you repeat uh, you repeat Christian names so much that you have to kind of have some kind of identifier. But it is funny whether or not like, you know, it's it's little Brian because he used to be little and now he's gigantic, uh, you know, and, and I don't know, it's just like the, the nickname that you come by when your child stays with you and either proves to be, um, you know, funnily accurate or like ironically not true. <laughs> I think so my family just does this with diminutive. So we have like James as a family name, but we have a Jim, a Jimmy and a 
you know, and a J and a, and a Peter James. And then we now have a new James because he was born after like great grandpa James has died. So he can be James again. He's the new generation ah. of James. <laughs> oh man. I'm sure there's so many comic book analogs that are running through your head, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> so many. There's so many. There's so many variations of Captain Miss Mrs. Marvel. Like there's just the so new many. Amazing Spider-Man X. Well, and this is the funny thing about about families because I was also thinking about taboo names in general. So you know, some cultures have taboos where you're not allowed to say something like your mother-in-law's name, uh, or you're not hmm. allowed to speak directly to certain branches of your of your in-laws or the family because it's kind of hmm. taboo taboos there. But we also have certain taboos. In English, in Western culture, for example, we did an episode of Lingthusiasm about names, and we were talking about whether you call your parents by their names. <gasps> never. Yes. And a lot of people came back to us exactly with that reaction, like, never, I would never call my parents by their names. It's so weird. I can't believe people do this. <laughs> or only in this very limited, restricted circumstance, you know, of like, I'm trying to get their attention at a crowded room and they're not responding to mom or dad. I have to say their name, but like, it's very functional. <laughs> yeah, that definitely happened to me where I was trying to get my dad's attention in a room of his colleagues and could not yell dad. So <laughs> I said, I said, Br Brian, and it was so like half hearted and under my breath. And when he turned around, I felt guilty. And it was just like, no, in my family culture, like that is a no way. Did he look at you with judgment in his eyes in that moment? No, I think he was just like, like that thing where your brain just snags onto your name. And then he turned around and he was like, oh, Amanda, I don't think you put two and two together, but <laughs> it made me feel super weird. Well, I mean, obviously people call him brian all the time it's just that you don't call him brian yeah yeah oh even you saying it again makes me uncomfortable let's move on <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> but th and this is this also kind of gets us to this linguistic phenomenon called the cocktail party effect which is people's ability to hear your own name mentioned in a conversation across the room even when you can't hear any other part of that conversation Oh, you mean the hey freeze as I try to listen to those people across the room and see if what they're saying is favorable or not effect? <laughs> yeah, like who like who are you talking about? You're talking about me? What is that? <laughs> That's so funny, but your brain is better able to snag onto your own name than it is like general conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Your name and also certain other taboo words, so you'll also better at hearing like swear words. Uh, yeah, like, that's your, true. Your attentions get snagged by swear words. The exciting words. <laughs> that's so funny. I mean, it makes total sense to me. Like you're, you know, you're. I'm sure your brain just kind of has ambient awareness of a lot of things that don't come into your actual consciousness. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that those exciting words, like the word sex, you know, or your own name, would make you more inclined, or something that you're worried about or scared about, you know, like that kind of paranoia might kind of heighten your awareness. Yeah, and it's really interesting because it sort of shows us that the brain is processing at some level stuff that it hears before it's even telling you that it's hearing it. Because it's kind of listening to that background chatter and just not making any of it rise to the level of your conscious awareness. And then when it hears something that's really salient or import potentially important for it, it's like, oh, well, you might want to know about this one because they're talking about you. Like Siri. <laughs> like, <laughs> your brain is actually Siri. Checks out. <laughs> That's so interesting, too, because I feel like that phenomenon does appear in folklore and urban legends and mythology as well, like certain folkloric characters that hear their own name and are suddenly summoned. You know what I mean? Well, That's true. The kind of classic example of like you say Bloody Mary three times in a mirror and something's supposed is. to happen. There she is. I'd Which we definitely did at Kimberly's house in first grade. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Kimberly's mom. <laughs> What's supposed to happen once she's there? I never I, quite understood this. I think she's supposed to reach through the mirror and grab you and take her either into her realm or take you and kill you, I think. That's Why? what the blood is for. I don't really know. Why or just would be you creepy and appear. That? I, it's like a, I it's know. like one of those truth or dare moments where it's like you don't have the courage to summon Bloody Mary, and then someone else is like, "Yeah, I do. I don't even think she's real. I'm gonna do it anyway." And then you do, and then you like scare the shit out of yourself because you're eight years old. Uh, okay. I mean, it's also made its way into Harry Potter, where saying Voldemort's name had a real or perceived power that people were, you know, really persuaded by for like twenty odd years. Yeah, and that one's really interesting because. People are saying Voldemort's name, and in the first several books, it's, well, Dumbledore, you know, is the only wizard he'd ever, he's ever been scared of, so he feels like he can say the name, and he tries to get Harry to say the name to show that he's not scared. But then right. by one of the later books, I forget if it's- The seventh six, book. Six or seven? It's seven. 
Yeah, there's yeah, actually yeah. like a tracing spell on the name, so you actually Harry has to actually not say it. And yeah, I think that was an example of people were scared of it, and so Voldemort took advantage of an existing phenomenon and as people were trying to like get through a war, you know, be more confident, give themselves something to hope for, and also because Harry specifically was saying it all over the place, you know, he he took advantage of that. Interestingly, I think that the curse that like would let Voldemort or Death Eaters know that it was his name was being said was actually called the taboo curse. So I think that's really? like an interesting kind of play on what we've been talking about the whole time. Wow. Yeah. And this this name Voldemorting was used in a paper by uh, a linguist named Emily Vandernagel to talk about an internet kind of taboo. And so uh. this is when, do you know how people like, sometimes people will search their names on Twitter just to see what people are saying about them? Yeah. Uh, definitely not something I've ever done. Yeah. You mean inviting death <laughs> not that any of us well healthy and well-adjusted people would ever no, do this <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about um but pe- so people sometimes search their names and if they're they find you saying something about them then that's you know they'll, they'll come after you or they'll send their fans or their troll army after you and so oh, people no. sometimes replace the names like the the letters in someone's name oh, with some yes. asterisks or they respell it or they talk about them obliquely so that when you do the search or when you, if you will, put the taboo spell on them mm. by doing a keyword search, mm. you don't return anything. That's so fascinating. So, and it's a matter of safety a lot yeah, of the time. You know, if you're exactly. talking about a politician or an Internet figure whose fans are known to, to make, you know, detractors unsafe. You don't want to put yourself in harm's way. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't want like Taylor Swift's fandom to come after you. <laughs> you might not want to criticize her like by her actual name. You might want to say something different. I mean, that's probably not an example because I imagine lots of people say the name Taylor Swift. So probably not, you know, it's hard for people them to find someone to go after. But like this is you a, would be like, surprised. Like a politician <laughs> who knows or like snitch tagging somebody in if I oh. criticize someone even by name and then somebody comes by and says, oh, well, you know, this person should know that you're mad at them. <gasps> that's, that's I've never heard that term. Worst. This it's is called so snitch tagging. Accurate. And Whoa. people have been complaining about it on the internet recently. Oh, it's the worst. Validly. Uh, and, but the kind of even more subtle version of that is don't use the person's actual name because they can keyword search for that. Mm-hmm. Use some sort of variation that's transparent to your audience. But because there are infinite variations, people are going to put those asterisks in different places. People are going to put those re- creative respellings slightly different ways. So they can't search for all of the possible variations and they probably won't find yours. Right. Yeah, which also throws a wrench in if you're trying to blacklist a certain word or avoid triggers. Like if somebody obscures the word in a way that is different and you didn't capture in your filtering, then it, like it's it's imperfect. Yeah, um, you know, I have but, a lot of prominent politicians' names muted on Twitter because it just keeps me too. <laughs> Twitter reasonable for me. And then if yep. people are are Voldemorting them, I'm like, well, I didn't have to see this person's name, but I did have to see what you were saying about them, and I actually didn't care. <laughs> Yeah, and I I remember this being kind of a fandom flame war topic, too, on Tumblr specifically, where, you know, people like people whose work is being discussed would do this and kind of go down the rabbit hole of searching their terms. But there's sort of an argument to be made to say, like, hey, fandom has a right to, like, talk privately about a thing. And if someone doesn't tag you or tag the work um, or if they, you know, are talking about a ship, but they don't want to tag the post with that ship's name so that the people who want to just see, like, good, pure, you know, love posting won't see the meta discussion Mm -hmm. like there is a whole kind of etiquette there that i feel like uh i'm so glad that people like you gretchen are talking about and documenting because otherwise like it would just have died in my brain and now in this post tumblr world r.i.p like we would never talk about it again well so i don't know if tumblr is completely r.i.p right now because there's another interesting connection to that because one of the things that's been going on with tumblr recently is of course there's this you know there's been this ban of you know, non-work safe, quote unquote, content, which has this very broad spectrum of like what they constitute as non-safe, non-work safe or pornographic or related. What to is this live journal in 2006? It's, people it's come all on. very questionable. <laughs> but one of the things that I've been seeing recently on Tumblr is because you can't tag things, you know, NSFW anymore because that tag is blocked. People have been reviving some old fanish terms such as lemon and lime oh, and man. orange to oh, tag man. things. That's such like I'm blushing right flashbacks. now. Flashbacks. Oh my god. Yeah. Tell the people what this means. So this is, I grant, not really part. It's only very loosely part of my own internet experience. But from what I've, from what's I've heard of in the lore, is a lemon is used for kind of a like PG thirteen fic where you know you have some 
some sexual content, I think. And then a lime is like more than that. It's more more R-rated, and then you also have an orange, which is totally safe, and then a grapefruit, which, like, maybe has kink in it or something, but I think there may be less agreement about what some of the, like, more obscure fruits actually indicate. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're... I assume that the fruits would go in size order, but they do not. They go in, in sort of, like, potency. I think uh... it's, like, acidity, potency order. <laughs> yes, oh my yes. god, that's so great. Uh, and so, anyway, so there's this newly popular post on Tumblr that's got, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of notes ex- re-explaining this citrus scale to the new generation of people on Tumblr to say, well, I guess if they're going to block our NSFW tags, here's what you can tag stuff with instead. Let's bring it back. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. So amazing. The internet's incredible. (laughs) Here's your fandom lore, people. Thank you. Thank you for that. (laughs) I don't don't miss those days, but I also kind of do a little bit. (laughs) Man, thinking about LiveJournal versus Tumblr in particular reminds me how startled I was to learn that on Tumblr you could change your username. Back on LiveJournal, it would be like the event of the century if somebody were to change their journal or like to to deactivate one journal and then start another one. Because unless I'm incorrect, you could not change the name of your blog. Or if you did, then all your URLs broke. And so the way we use the internet back then, (laughs) kids, is like, you know, I chose a, a handle that I went by and that was my handle on all the sites because otherwise, how would my friends find me um, and like that you know I decided on it it was mine it said something about me and my identity and then when I got to Tumblr and I was like wait these kids are changing their names like they can change their name and their avatar and I would have no idea that this blog was the blog that I once saw unless they had something like you know tagging conventions um, or just a style that I recognized so I, I realized too that the idea of like searching a real person's name on Twitter is kind of like level one of the of the exploding brain meme. But when you get all the way up to like, you know, these intricate layers of choosing and then discarding and then like remixing your identity. I don't know. There's just I'm sure smarter people than me have written a lot about this. But I it's, have actually, it's something. Ooh, ooh, well, I've actually which, talked about this about in about my it. book, <laughs> uh, which is coming out in July. Uh, and hey. about how... This is also related to internet history as a whole. So in the early days of the internet, there was this assumption that you had a pseudonym on the internet and most people didn't use their real names on the internet. Or if they did, they might use like a a real first name, but something that was very common, like, oh, I'm Matt. Well, you can never find me among the millions of Matts. Um, Matt 13. I I never used my real name on, on the internet, but in the pseudonymous days, because there are not that many Gretchens and you can track people pretty quickly from that Mm -hmm. um i didn't get to disappear in the anonymous mats and rachel's (laughs) yeah I never used my birth year either because A, people would know I was like 11 and B, uh, I knew that that was like personally identifying information and I, I like lied a little bit. I was like, oh yeah, I'm from, I'm from Vermont instead of New York. <laughs> Why Vermont? Why Vermont? Well, I always wanted to grow up on a farm and Vermont there is we pretty. Go. That's, so. that's what I was wondering. That's it. Yeah. That's my sister one. used her real first name, but she used the last name Smith. Fair. Smart. Got it. She's like, oh, well, my last name is pretty distinctive, but, you know, no one no one recognized another Smith. <laughs> so this very early days, you have this pseudonym, but it's your handle and it's how your friends are going to recognize you from one social network to, to another. And from one chat room to another and these kinds of things. And people had these fairly persistent handles. And in the slightly later generation of people who joined the Internet primarily as teens, interacting as teens, um, I'm thinking of this especially in the instant messaging days where people would change their usernames on instant messaging, but it was okay because you knew who people were because they were all people that you'd already met offline pretty much or friends right. of friends. Mm. And so if True. you change your your IM name, then you still know this this is this person that's like in your English class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a it's like another version of changing your away message or changing your profile, just like saying something new and interesting about your identity slash your crush. Exactly. So it becomes a way, so usernames, even though they look superficially similar to people who are outside of the internet culture change from becoming a way of you know a name a name like a naming your identity to a way of performing identity in a very fluid sort of way mm-hmm. hmm. and so when i saw people changing usernames on tumblr and they tend to be the younger users changing their names i was like oh this is like back when we used to change our usernames all the time in these instant messaging days because you're you're still working through who your identity is and you're declaring your allegiance to this fandom or to that fandom or to this type of thing or to that type of thing and you're working out who you are and you're trying to create a relatively deliberately obscure trail for people who know you offline to potentially follow you because let's say your parent bookmarks your Tumblr blog because they find <gasps> it. Oh. Nightmare. 
but then you've changed your your username and they come back six months later trying to creep on you again and they can't find you anymore because the bookmark doesn't work. Ha <laughs> ha. But your oh, friends and I was... who have used yeah. the interface to follow you, that following relationship is preserved. So you don't lose your friends, but people who don't understand Tumblr lose you really quickly. That's so fascinating. And and yeah, my first thought when I learned people could change their names was like, oh my God, what about all the links? Like, what about all the URLs? Because I guess in my era of coming up on the internet, which was kind of like, you know, early aughts, like forums and fandom, um, you know, someone deleting their blog was like the the worst case scenario because their work was posted in one place. It was, you know, friend walls or something and you I mean, couldn't get it death. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. exactly yeah and so you know i learned very early on like people think that i have like a weird style of preserving and bookmarking like everything i love and ever know but i was like you never know when it's going to be deleted and with the internet archive and stuff that's that's not as true as it was anymore but i guess there's this kind of like scarcity or preservation minded you know generation like micro generation of us mm. where like well, that would just be kind of unthinkable and instead you have this so Tumblr preserves the reblog architecture even when your URLs change. So yeah. links that you create in a post might break, but links that you create, but your friends who know what your username has changed to can just sub in your new username and it'll still work mm -hmm. because the post ID number doesn't change. And mm -hmm. your reblogs all still work and Tumblr will automatically resolve all of those. So it doesn't, it breaks some stuff, but it doesn't break as much as it would have under a live journal or earlier type of blogging model. Uh, when you change your name on Tumblr. And I guess this does kind of uh, harken back to this idea of like a true essence, like a true identity. You know, like even though my username may change, my friends or my mutuals, whatever, you know, they're, they're going to know who I am. Even if they don't know my IRL, you know, name on my driver's license or my social security number or whatever, um, they they know that there's like a, like a true and constant person under all of that kind of uh, changing of the the artifice. Well, and because na usernames are used to perform identity, picking a username is a way of declaring allegiance to a particular fandom or particular thing, and that helps other people in that fandom find you. But if you decide, oh, actually, I'm not a fan of One Direction anymore, or like, I'm not a fan of this TV show anymore, you don't necessarily want a username that's still associated with that, like just so people from that fandom can find you. You now want a username that's associated with your new favorite fandom, so people from that fandom can know that you're a fellow fan. And because you're declaring who you are through these various kinds of pop culture allegiances. Whereas if you're going to keep the same username, you want something that's less transient and less specifically tied to a particular fandom because you're, you think, okay, I'm, I'm going to be stuck with this for the next 20 years. Yeah. But revealing someone's, you know, like offline name, if you will, or social security number or these kinds of things is also this weird way of kind of having this power over them. Like doxing someone is a similar kind of like magical power you can have some over someone on the internet in the same way that like, oh, if I have, if I know Rumpelstiltskin's name, I have this kind of control over him. Mm -hmm. Releasing someone's name on the internet is this... I think it also speaks to that sort of tension between like knowing someone's true name or knowing someone's true identity can give you that kind of power over them. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely true. And like you said, like the the online name is very transient. It can change with like your interests and with your just like what you're into at the moment and like how you are are identifying at the moment. Uh, while a legal name does carry implications and carries certain like strengths and weaknesses that come with using that, and, and what society dictates is important. Yeah, and you can change it, but you have to go through a lot more paperwork than just going into the settings page and, and putting in something different. And revealing someone's name that was previously their legal name, but they've chosen to be a different legal name is also a way of kind of exerting a sort of power, often a malicious power over them. Yes, I, I agree. I was just going to ask in kind of a Rumpelstiltskin scenario, you know, in, in that tale, it meant something because he offered it up as like a, a you know, wager. And if the protagonist found out, then there would be clear consequences. And so I was going to ask you, oh, well, you know, if we like know the fairy's true name or something, you know, what does that actually mean? But then I realized like the potential to control someone and actual controlling them is almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like whether like whether or not you could convince someone to do whatever you want just by saying their name, whether or not you do is is almost inconsequential because it's that it's that like just a uh, threat that is akin to controlling someone directly yeah the threat of control yeah it's a sort of yeah. blackmail with personal identifiable information and it's one of those like middle names also have this weirdly secretive status 
Yes. Where they're not, in, there isn't inherently anything particularly secret about them, but a lot of people are like, oh, I don't, I don't want to really reveal my middle name. Or like, what do you, when I was in, you know, grade school, like telling someone your middle name was like one of those like things you did to like bond as a friend. You're like, oh, well, I'll tell you my middle name and then we'll have a shared secret. Mm-hmm. It only It's only secretive because we assign it that secretive quality. Yeah, or like it's more likely to be old fashioned, you know, if your parents chose like a more of the moment first name for you and then a family name as your middle name. Um, that's so funny. I was just reading recently about how middle names, uh, some people speculate, came out of uh, like royal um, tradition in England, at least for the kind of English speaking, like from England tradition in the US, um, mm-hmm. where, you know, having like a family name and an ancestry or like multiple families of status you know combined to this new line you had multiple names to signify it was kind of was like a very posh thing Hmm. um and then people without that necessarily started just adding them on because it was aspirational or it's now possibility like for whatever reason yeah a lot of people give like the mother's surname sometimes as the middle name or you know like another family name or something they use that to show a, a family connection um there's also, um, I know in, in Chinese and Korean, they have a tradition of generation names. Mm-hmm. So you have your family name, you have your generation name, and you have your actual given name. And the generation name is shared by everyone that's also at your generation. So your siblings and your cousins of the same generation and so on. And there's a generation name poem that your family has that you cycle through to get those names. Interesting. That's amazing. That would be very useful in my family yeah. <laughs> instead of being like the the parents, the cousins. Now the cousins have kids. Like we call them the babies. Like they're going to be 10 soon. You know, like what do we do? Yeah, exactly. So you have those and and those are like a like part of someone's part of someone's name. So um, one of the other things I'm I'm forgetting if it's either middle names or communion names in uh, Catholicism, but uh, one of those I think was speculated as a sort of like fairy tale related thing, where it is if you are meeting someone and you don't want to give them the power of your name, you would provide either if it's the communion one, it's like the devil, uh, but if it's <laughs> like if it's just middle names, I think it might have been like a, a some fay related incident, but um, I'm pretty sure that it's like. This is the name that you would give to someone if you don't want them to exert power over you. I thought about using my middle name as like a Starbucks name or something <laughs> because well, a lot of people who have less common names also have a Starbucks name that's like easier to spell. Mm-hmm. And I also find it weirdly personal for someone at a cafe to know my actual name. Like we're just engaging in a customer service interaction. We're not friends <laughs> here. Mm-hmm. Um, or like when I have done customer service jobs and people like will read your name off your name tag and like start calling you that. And you're like, I didn't give you permission to use this. Excuse me. Is the instinct it. then is like, oh, yes, it's nice to meet you. Please tell me your name now. Yeah, exactly. But but requiring in someone's name just to buy a coffee also creates this weird social situation. Or like, oh, like what name should I put on the cup? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that's like a lot of people have Starbucks names that are, OK, I'm just going to use this. This pseudonym. Yeah, or all kinds of complicating things like, you you know, like a, a gender presentation and, you know, dead names versus names that you, you know, use and choose for yourself or your immigration status or heritage or something about, you know, what your name says and the context in which you're using it. You know, it is really powerful and it does have a ton of signifiers in some cases about the person. So having the I, I love the idea of the Starbucks name. It's not always great that you have to use it, you know, like it's Mm. often a name of last resort or an adaptation to a culture that is necessarily friendly to you. But um, in this discussion of, you know, usernames and different ways that we present ourselves to the world, like there's just so much power in it. Um, And it's it feels like so in scope for uh, Spirit's discussion. Yeah, I have a Starbucks name in French, but not in English because I live in Montreal. I'm often buying coffee in French. English speakers do fine with Gretchen, and there's only one way to spell Gretchen. English speakers, like, recognize it as a name. They know it's not very common, but they generally have an idea of how to spell it. But speakers of European languages that aren't English or, of course, German are like, what the heck is this name? What What is possible? <laughs> what letters go into this, please? They're like, do you mean Greta or Gretel? Because a lot of time they've heard of those names, but not mm. Gretchen. And so in French Starbucks... I say Rachel or Rachel <laughs> because Rachel's the name that people mishear Gretchen as. Huh. Because it's got a ch in the middle. Mm. And there's like an 
like an R at the beginning, and if the G kind of and the, swallows the R, which especially with the French R, it kind of swallows. So in the French context, I have a Starbucks name, but then when I go to the U.S., which is you know not my native country, uh, I then get to use my real name because I'm interacting with Anglophones again. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, man. It just it really is like code switching in in a super applied context yeah yeah whereas if i forget and order a drink in english in montreal i can use gretchen again because a lot of people are bilingual but i like to use french because you know it i'm one of you like it, it's it's better for solidarity and it's like more interesting for me as a linguist to practice my french and so on but if i want to do that i can't actually use my real name not in a transactional customer service context <laughs> do you guys want to know an embarrassing secret yes please sure. tell me Right into the microphone, please. Yep, exactly. To the to the ears of tens of thousands of people. Um, when I was a kid, we would go to stay with my grandparents for several weeks at a time um, in in rural upstate New York. And um, sometimes when my brother and I would be allowed to like go into town on our own to like buy candy at the at the like nickel and dime store or whatever, like go to the movies, um, I would use a British accent because I was obsessed <laughs> with Harry Potter and uh, just like watch The Parent Trap or something. <laughs> and I just really, I just really wanted that fantasy of like being from somewhere else and just like being like being very just like oh yes I'm summering in like Fawcett or whatever um and I would just do, and like my brother bless his heart thought it was really fun and like played my cousin you know Tom or something um and it was very sweet that's so pure <laughs> I love you so much thanks I actually shifted my French accent when I moved to Montreal because I had acquired I had been taught like European French in schools even though they were schools in Canada uh, because it's more prestigious. And then I moved here and I was like, I'm Canadian. I'm going to be living in this city for, you know, who knows how many years. There's no reason why I shouldn't have a Quebec accent, mm -hmm. except for the fact that like through snobbery, I haven't been taught it. <laughs> so I have tried, I tried my best. And now these days I pretty much have a Quebec accent without thinking about it, but I deliberately, I consciously shifted my accent over to the accent that I should have. Okay. From a, like, historical perspective rather than the accent that I should have from like a prestige perspective. Yeah. I mean, there's so many layers there, right? Like yeah. the, the one that you're, that you're taught to want to have yeah. versus, Oh, well you can only acquire this accent by, by being really of the people and growing up here. Um, there's just, ah, there's so much. I love names. Oh my God. But Language like squared. while I was incompletely acquiring a Quebecois accent, people really had a hard time figuring out where I was from. Uh, and they'd be like, so they, they could tell that I didn't quite have like a Parisian accent, but they'd be like, are you from Belgium? Are you from Switzerland? <laughs> Where could you possibly be from? Like, it's not quite your, it's not quite the one we're used to, but it's also not quite up here. And I was like, oh I yeah, that's no. cool. So. It's like a fascinating, I mean, I, I guess for someone with the, with the privilege of like having a place where they belong, having that kind of, you know, mystique or like misdirect is interesting. Um, like I, I've never been in a position to like really need to be accepted as being where I'm from, um, you know, which is just its its own um, context. But that is just a really real and like a thing that people reckon with every day, you know, of like, am I am I being um, seen or am I being presenting myself as yeah. being like homogenous to this place? And I feel a lot more like a fake if I'm changing my English accent because, you know, I do mm. speak English you know, all growing up and so on. And I do have a, a proper history for that. And I've changed it subtly depending on where I've lived, but I haven't changed it, you know, a whole bunch very consciously. Um, but for, for the French accent, I had no particular allegiance to any particular accent anyway. And so I was like, well, I should pick, you know, I, I should just pick a different one because I will in the future, having now lived in Montreal for what, like, uh, you know, eight years I now have a very good reason to have a Montreal accent, but I started developing it before I had a good reason to have it. Yeah. Or like I have friends who were raised somewhere um, by families in diaspora and made the choice to to assume or to retain the accent of their family culture, even though it's different to the one where they were being raised, mm. um, because like that is an important link and kind of identifier for them where I just I, I don't see that as being like artificial or put on at all. Like it's it's making a like some people make a choice some people just kind of grow up and then they have to kind of reckon with or decide um how their natural quote unquote like environment jives with their identity but i don't know to me that that's that's totally in in fair fair game uh, deciding how the world sees you is a choice you get to make and there's linguistic research about this actually where a lot of cases people's attitudes have this big effect on their accent and sometimes people use the word rootedness to describe whether people uh, have a particularly uh, like 
pick on pick an accent that's close to a local identity or close to a particular culture. So if you feel a sense of rootedness in a particular identity, you're more likely to have that accent. Whereas if you don't feel rooted in that identity, then you're likely to reject that accent and do something that's hmm. maybe more common in the mainstream culture. Hmm. Wow. Oh, it's so good. Well, Julia, let's um, go use our Starbucks names in the kitchen as we grab a refill. Sounds good. Amanda, this week I want to talk to you about Stitch Fix. You know, I have some great outfits and it's nearly springtime and Stitch Fix is 100% to blame for the fact that I look great this spring. <laughs> you really do. You look great in the winter. You look great in the fall and the summer before that. But springtime, something about it to me is just like you can mix any fabrics. You can wear lace and leather and like linen all in the same outfit and any other L fabrics and you're going to look great. I have this great yellow floral shirt that Stitch Fix sent me that I rock with a leather jacket and I mm-hmm. I just look at myself in the mirror I'm like damn girl damn and you too can look in the mirror and say damn when you see yourself by going to stitchfix.com slash spirits exactly Stitch Fix is the online personal styling service you write them notes you give them your sizes you say like oh shirts are always too big on me or the armhole is too low or the waist is too high and then they send you things that are picked exactly for you fits your body fits your lifestyle fits your budget And if you don't like the things, you can send them right back. And shipping is free both ways. And when you go to stitchfix.com slash spirits and you sign up and you keep all five items in your box, you get 25% off. So that's stitchfix.com slash spirits to get started today. Again, stitchfix.com slash spirits. Julia, I love it a lot. And I actually stressed out a lot over what to wear in my Skillshare course, for which I filmed several videos over the course of one very cold, cold day in the Skillshare studio. Um, And I ended up going with a Stitch Fix shirt. So this is just, you know, mid-roll crossover event of the millennium. I love it. Tell me about that Skillshare class, though. Absolutely. I was actually on a couple different podcasts this week talking about my idea of what marketing is. And I think marketing is just storytelling. It's just knowing how to articulate your project, what you want to do, and who you want to reach. So in my Skillshare course, which is titled Podcast Marketing, I walk you through an exercise where you try to figure out who specifically are you making your stuff for? Because it's not useful to just make art that you want everyone to enjoy. Because it's not actually useful to make art for everyone. Everyone one is never going to like anything. So knowing specifically who you're doing this for, whose feedback you care about, and where to reach those people online, that's what I try to teach people in my course. So you can go to skillshare.com slash spirits2, that's the word spirits and the number two, to get two free months of Skillshare premium. You can then take my course, you can take any other courses, it's unlimited, and there are like over 25,000 classes, so plenty there for you to enjoy. That is skillshare.com slash spirits2, for two free months of Skillshare Premium. Skillshare.com slash spirits2 and Amanda's class is podcast marketing. Take it, you will enjoy it. Thanks. Now let's get back to the show. Well, this kind of reminds me of something from the Odyssey because I was reading that recently and there's this gorgeous new uh, Emily R.C. Wilson translation of the Odyssey. Uh, bear, bear, bear. My fave. <laughs> Emily, come on the show. <laughs> Anytime, Emily, she please. She's so cool. Uh, I follow her on Twitter and she's so interesting. And she talks about how she translated the epithets that are used for the characters in the Odyssey. So most of the recurring characters in the Odyssey have a particular set of adjectives or short way that they're used to describe. And one of those is rosy fingered dawn. So Beautiful. every new morning... You get rosy fingered dawn, kind you know, of sexy, a rose from her couch, and so on and so forth. Because oh. of course, the dawn is often pink, uh, and they personify dawn as a character, Aurora, and these kind, of, so on. Just uh, fan myself a little bit at the imagery; it's fine. <laughs> Very sexy, as Amanda uh, said. And you have bright eyed, like, like, like lemon sexy though, like maybe orange sexy. It's not that bad. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, and you have bright-eyed Athena um, and Odysseus, who is often described as polytropos or many turning, which some some versions translate as cunning or uh, the. What I really like about R.C. Wilson's translation is that she translates him as complicated. Uh, yeah, he is. <laughs> and- That's not even a question. Brooding Odysseus. <laughs> which is cool because complicated has this etymology, which is kind of a Latinate version, which is very similar to the Greek many turned or many turning. And complicated is calm with and plicare, which is to fold. 
So like hmm. with folded or or like folded together. Oh, that's so freaking cool. That's amazing. Yeah, many layered. Yeah, many layered, exactly. Um, but of course it also brings back to me like Avril Lavigne, like why'd you have to go to make things so complicated? <laughs> Oh, hundred oh, percent. This is just like a flashback back to the early two thousands, isn't it? This whole episode, <laughs> acting like somebody else gets me frustrated. Yeah, uh, and this is kind of what Odysseus is doing in the story of the Odyssey. Like he's he's complicated. He's many turned. He's turned about and you know prevented from getting back home. But he's also like not necessarily unambiguously the good guy. No, mm. he is not. He does some not great things in a lot of the parts of the story. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of the trans, a lot of the English translations kind of treat him, foist him more into this unambiguous hero narrative because we're used to our protagonists being heroes, and yeah. yet thinking about him as more complicated is, I think, a more interesting version of the story and also a more authentic version of the story. For sure, for sure. So does Emily use that same um, complicated to describe him every time? Well, no. And so that's also what's interesting is that in the the Greek version of this story, because it's originally an oral poem, and one thing we know about oral language is that it relies a lot more on repetition because, you know, you only, your working memory is only so long. And so it's useful to repeat things more uh, when it's produced orally versus when it's produced in a written sort of way. And so the epithets in the Greek are very consistent. You know, Dawn is always described the same way. Athena is always described the same way. Odysseus is always described the same way. And it's a way of kind of providing an anchor for the readers to remember who the characters are and to contextualize themselves and find themselves. And these repetitive elements are really useful in an oral poem. Mm. But of course, Wilson's not writing for an oral audience. Although, let me be real, I would totally have a reading out loud odyssey party if anyone and wants to come over and have one whenever it happens we are there 100 <laughs> percent. listen my single favorite thing to do while drinking is to recite poetry slash read shakespeare so i think i need to like roast some sun god's cattle on spits mm -hmm. and then have a lot of wine and <laughs> olive juice mm -hmm. and olive oil Love it. That's very good. That's so and much. I'm only ever going to describe olive oil as olive juice from now on. Um, <laughs> but it makes sense. Like, it's like when you read song lyrics that listening to the song, it's like, OK, I, we get it. We repeat the chorus. OK. But when you're listening to it, it makes total sense. Exactly. And so, uh, yeah, so Wilson's posted about the fact that she decided to make things not as repetitive in the English version because it's more of a reflection for a reading audience, and she knows that's what she's writing for. But she does write the whole translation in, in verse, so it's all in iambic pentameter, mm. which, you know, again, reflects, is, is a slightly different than the original Greek verse, but is a more Englishy verse, and really creates this gorgeous rhythm in the translation. That's awesome. Those are my favorite kinds of um, adaptations or translations, one where it, it preserves an effect um, and not necessarily like the, the precise device used to achieve that effect originally. Exactly. Oh, man. In this house, we stan Emily Wilson <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry to like really intimately just call her Emily, but I just find her to be a friend. I, mean, I should probably say Dr. Wilson. She probably mm -hmm. has a, a PhD. I'm trying to not do the thing. Here's names again, where when you're referring yes. to a woman, we call her by their first name. And then when you're referring to a man, you call them by their... Their surname. Oh, the thing I just did because I want to be her friend. Yep, no, yeah, I no, knew I, exactly I apologize. Emily R.C. Wilson, Dr. Wilson, I'm sure you're a doctor. Uh, thank you for your wonderful work. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, the classic story about names from the Odyssey is this moment where Odysseus is in the cave of the Cyclops. And he's trying to trick the Cyclops and he gets trapped in this cave. And when he's when he's tricking the Cyclops, I think he stabs him through the eye. Ooh. Yeah, well, that sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Odysseus cries out and says, who's done this to me? And Odysseus claims that his name is effectively no man, the Greek equivalent of. Yeah. OK, John Doe. No, it's but like, like no, no, no like one. nobody. Yeah. And so Odysseus is like um, Polyphemus, the, uh, the the Cyclops is saying, no one has done this to me. No one has done this to me. And so the no other Cyclops me in the eye. are like, well, no one stabbed stop you in your yourself. eye. You, yeah, stop hitting yourself. Like, you fool, you stabbed yourself in the eye. Like, we're not going to help you. Oh, my God. Rude. Odysseus is like, ha, ha, ha. I'm so cunning. I'm so polytropos. But then the problem is then once Odysseus escapes, he brags about having done this with his true name. You dummy. You dummy. <laughs> Amateur move. Um, which allows, which Polyphemus overhears 
and um, curses him and calls upon his father Poseidon, the Cyclops' father, um, to take revenge by sending a storm to destroy Odysseus' ships. And this is what causes the whole set of problems in the Odyssey. This is why it takes him, like, what, two decades to get yeah. home. I think, like, 30 years or something. He's been cursed by Poseidon because he was foolish enough to announce his name to the Cyclops after having so nearly gone away with it. Yeah, and the only reason that he doesn't actually perish is because he's under the guardianship of Athena, and Athena is like, okay, he can get lost, but you're not going to just, like, kill him with a storm. Yeah. And so I think, like, a- announcing a name or signing something with your name or claiming something with your name can have a power for yourself, even though it can also send people after you. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's claiming responsibility and and making a connection to a thing. Um, like torrenting something at your parents' house without a VPN, you know, you just, you <laughs> tie, you tie the crime to the person. I'm so sorry. I did indeed torrent a copy of Paper Towns when it came out. Cause I was proud of my friend, John. Um, <laughs> and I did get a DMCA notice. Whoops. Oh my gosh. Did. I'm just confessing all my sins here. My you internet are. Sins. This is just like a wild Amanda sin podcast now. Well, this is the other thing that I was thinking about when I talked, thinking about trying to make the familiar strange, like, do you call your parents by your name? We also have a whole second alphabet that's primarily used for names. Yeah. Like capital letters? The capital letters. That's true. And you use them for, you know, proper nouns or for names, effectively, to make and to make something more name-like. Ooh, talk about Puritans. Those motherfuckers love putting capital letters on any <laughs> virtue. Yeah, virtue. Well, and and not all languages do this, right? So German puts capital letters on any noun. That's, uh, and oh, that makes more sense. Plenty of languages don't have capital letters at all. That makes sense. Uh, but I've so I've recently seen people uh, complaining that like, oh, if I'm typing in Arabic, if I'm typing in in Hebrew or something, I can't shout if, as effectively on the internet because I can't type the oh whole thing in capitals to make it shouty. Just all the exclamation points afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> or like, how do you shout in Japanese? They don't have capitals. That's true. How do people shout with with like a, a underscores or something? Um, so sometimes people use yeah, like underscores or asterisks or something like this. Um, sometimes I think they also use. Oh, I can't. I guess remember. emoji now. Yeah, emoji can help. Um, or if you can like, if you can make it bold or something like that, it can help. Um, oh, so in Japanese, people switch from people write a word that should be in kanji or hiragana in in katakana instead. Oh, okay. So they also switch from one of their their writing systems to another, and that creates this effective emphasis uh, in a way that's kind of similar to using capital letters. <laughs> so do that. they switch from informal to formal, vice versa, or is that like too reductive of the of the systems you're talking I, about? I don't think it's informal to formal. Like I don't speak Japanese, but some we were talking about this, like how do you capitalize things or how do you shout about things when you in a writing system that doesn't have capital letters? And somebody who spoke Japanese was telling me, like, oh well, if this word would normally be written in kanji, then I can write it in katakana instead, and that has some sort of similar shouting effect. Okay. Um, but of That's course, fascinating. if you want to just make it longer, you can also use the the tilde or the the wave dash. I love the wave. Oh dash. yeah, um, which is that. But that's 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 more like repeating it um, in English. You can use I... that to make it longer. I really uh, hate that the tilde makes uh, a strike through in, I think, Slack oh, and yes. a couple yes. other places. I hate because that so I'm, again, much. like, my internet micro generation uses the tilde to have emphasis. Like, okay, so thanks. I'm like, I'm going to see a boy later. Like, I'd put yeah. tildes around the boy. And, like, it, it just gives it some kind like of, like, sarcastic. italicizing. I also hate that I think Slack and WhatsApp both do this. When you put uh, asterisks around something, it changes it to bold. And it's like, yes, this is not markdown. This is chat. I'm not <laughs> in a document where I'm trying to compose a text. Mm-hmm. I'm in a I conversation so where I want to markdown, emphasize man. things in a particular way. I've been using the uh, like sparkle emoji in those instances instead yes. because it adds that same like like nuanced emphasis to a word there. It's like, ooh. The sparkle yeah, emoji we're, we're... is really good. I also sometimes I just put an extra space in between that and the word and it won't auto format. Okay. Yeah. Or or the spaces in between each letter to really drag mm. something out similar to a tilde effect. Um, and we're completely just talking about like writing on the internet now. <laughs> but I, I All of my love... conversations turn into writing about the internet. This is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is an occupational hazard. Um, but I love emoji. Like as somebody who has trouble identifying and articulating my feelings, having emoji code with my 
friends and my partner is so helpful to be able to be like, you know, uh, uh, a sun with a big cloud in front of it. Like I'm feeling kind of shy and withdrawn today. Like it's mm. just, it's just, it's so, it's so useful, man. I feel like I want to say so many things about this, but I also feel like I wrote them out in far more articulate detail in my book. So I want to like, <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. Please buy because internet starting in July, 2019. And if you're listening to this in the future, good for you. You can get buy the book it, right, buy now. It right now. Uh, there's a whole chapter about emoji. Uh, and another whole chapter about <gasps> punctuation. So oh, yes. Yes. I'm so ready. Gonna love it. <laughs> Anything about names and their power and the way we talk about them that we didn't get to cover in this wonderful jam-packed episode? I think the only example that I had that I didn't get to bring up was the weird way names are used in Houses of Parliament. <gasps> all right. Tell, tell me, me more. Tell me everything. 1776 is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> so, uh... If you think about how people talk to each other in, you know, House of Commons, House of Parliament, Senates, and so on, the there's often a rule that says only the speaker may be addressed directly. So you say, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And then you say, you know, as the honorable member for so-and-so said, or as the senator from wherever said, blah, blah, blah. And you don't get to say, as you said, <laughs> you fool. <laughs> You absolute idiot. As Ben said, Ben. Um, or as yeah, as my as my dear friend and colleague has just said. Um, and so there's there's this rule where you can't address people by uh directly in the second person, and you often can't you can't even necessarily say their names, you know, as like Joe Smith, the senator from whatever said, you're often saying specifically this third person epithet. And I think it's originally supposed to be to minimize the chance of people having bad tempers and insulting each other and deliberately saying, you know, quote unquote, unparliamentary language. Ooh, I feel man. like it did the opposite of that. But oh, now yeah. it's this no, like Intention subtle finds a way. It's very cheeky. Like I, I didn't know this was a rule and I thought they were just saying it so that they would, they were just being ironic or something like using the most uh, like quote unquote professional language to express complete disdain toward the person that was just Amanda's speaking. assumption is everyone is an asshole. Yeah, no, mm, I think kind of. I, from what I can tell, this is actually a real rule and now it's become associated with disdain because of course they're still going to insult each other. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Um, and like I used to do this back when I was in school and like I was on the debate team and you had to address like, you know, as the as honorable the prime minister or, has yeah. said or as the opposition yeah. leader has said. And we did this and this was, just, this was just what you did. But we were kind of imitating a parliament. <laughs> that's uh, so funny. Yeah, and you could be really cutting. Yeah, I, I am a real fan of politeness as aggression, uh, particularly in business emails. Oh, my God, yes. Like it's ending an email with sincerely when you are like really annoyed. Oh, uh, my favorite is warmest regards. <laughs> Ouch. Warmest regards, aka you stone cold bitch. Love Amanda. <laughs> aka f off. Or like oh, yeah. per my previous email. Oh, my favorite. Mm -hmm. My 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 genuine my genuine favorite. If someone really has made me angry, is just to is just to copy the exact text of the previous email and send it again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that is stone cold. It's it's best it. done really sparingly. Like I think I've done it twice maybe, but it it really gets the job done. <laughs> That's really good. I also really like I like analyzing speaking of names, how people are thinking about me in terms of how they address me in an email, especially when it's the first email they've ever sent to me. It's like a cold email. My email address is on my website. I get lots of cold emails. Some of them are better than others. <laughs> <laughs> that's very very polite of you to say <laughs> some of them are really fantastic like i've i've you know come across a lot of really interesting stuff from them and some of them are like wow you decided to do that okay and you get a couple of my favorites are the ones from really young people who obviously have no idea how to address me and so they're not going to take any chances and they're just like hello oh. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like oh okay oh, I see sweet, what you're trying sweet to do summer there. child i get what's going on <laughs> Um, and my other favorites are the ones from people who are clearly speakers of uh, native speakers of European languages, which are not English, and have clearly learned that the equivalent for madame or frau or signora is Mrs. Mrs. Oh, and right. In most of those countries, there has become a reaction against mademoiselle and fraulein and signorita, and adult women don't use those anymore. Those are for like your maiden right. aunt. And 
they just have, they've been popularizing this pair of senor, senora, er, frau, madame, monsieur. Like, they don't, th- those are becoming normalized and you don't use the diminutive version anymore. Mm. Yeah, they don't mean marry, they just mean grown. They just mean which grown up. Probably, yeah, probably which, that was the signifier originally. Yeah, which is fine. And if I'm asked to give a title in French, I will say madame. I'm not married, but I will say madame because mm-hmm. right. I am a grown up woman and mademoiselle is for little girls. Uh, but, and they've also learned that Mrs. is the equivalent of those. So they will send me emails addressed to Mrs. McCulloch. Aww. You're like, where is And you're Mr. like, Mom. McCulloch? <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, I'm like, this is like my grandmother, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> Like, yeah. my mom didn't even really use this that much. Yeah. Aww. <laughs> like, so pure. Like, who is this person? And of course, I know exactly why it happens, and I find it very amusing. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but there's, an, I don't, I haven't found a way to say on my website, like, you don't need to address me by a title, but if you feel like you need to address me by a title, the correct <laughs> one is definitely not Mrs. Aww. And I know. Ms. is like not necessarily in the repertoire of like what people are being taught in English as a second language classes, especially it or, wasn't. Or even English lessons in the US or Canada yeah. or other places. Like it, it's just a, a weird sticky thing. And until mix becomes the title for someone for whom you don't know their specific title, you know, we're going to have to sort of have these funny um, Yeah, I've never gotten encounters. mix. You know, vive mix. It's very, it's very uh, I love versatile. It. I think it's I great. I like it. It makes you sound like a wonderful uh, David Bowie style, like space alien rock star. And <laughs> yeah, I love it. it. But and there was this controversy about Ms. back, you know, in the 70s. And now it's pretty generically mm-hmm. applied. Like generally when I get an email with a title, it is Ms., which I'm fine with. Meaning M.S. period. M.S. Um, period. Not yeah, so Miss. M.I.S.S. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I've ever gotten. If I've gotten Miss, it's very, very rarely. <laughs> and I would not encourage people to use it. <laughs> Well, I am so excited for listeners to tell us their association stories, questions with names and everything we've discussed um, in folklore, in their cultures, in their lives, because this really is so personal. Yeah, it really touches on so many, so many personal stories and what, you know, so the story of how you got your name and the kinds of names you get called and the kinds of names that have power is there are so many great stories about this. Uh, speaking of names, Gretchen, why don't you tell people where they can find you on the internet? You can find me at GretchenMcCulloch.com if you want links to everything that I do and links to the book and so on. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at Gretchen A-M-C-C. All right, fantastic. And Gretchen, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about this. It was such an interesting topic. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. It was our pleasure. And remember, stay creepy, stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service, and you can get 25% off when you keep all of the items they send you by going to stitchfix.com slash spirits. And Skillshare is an online learning community where you can learn and teach just about anything from people like me. So visit skillshare.com slash spirits two, the word spirits number two, to get two months of Skillshare premium for free. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.